Hey guys, this is Srini and in this video I'm going to talk about 3D unit based semantic segmentation. This is uh, very heavily requested by you guys, especially in relation to uh, segmenting BRATS dataset or FIBSIM dataset or CT, right? So anytime you work with 3D volumes, think of a 3D unit for semantic segmentation. Okay, and uh, I tried to get my hands onto the BRATS dataset, either 2017, 18, 19. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get my hands on it, but that's okay. Whatever I'm going to show you should be easily be applied to any type of 3D volume dataset. So I'm not going to just show you a binary segmentation, okay, because that's easy. I'm going to show you multi-class segmentation and I'm going to show you, as you can see on the screen, multi-class segmentation on the same data set that we have analyzed in the past, okay, except in the past we have done 2D slice at a time, okay. Now let's take 3D, uh, uh, you know, sub-volumes at a time and then train our model and then actually spit out the result as a segmented data set so we can actually work with individual classes. So what I'm going to do is spit out both, uh, I'm going to show you uh, both, uh, uh, you know, uh, just a 3D volume output, but also a 4D volume output, which is a 3D volume plus each channel as separate channels, so you can turn the channels on and off. Along the way, I'll also show you how you can open these 3D images for free, online or local, but uh, uh, let's let's just uh, get a quick understanding of what this 3D unit is and then let's jump into the code. And for code, I'm going to use Colab because 3D unit, you do need GPU. I tried to use my GPU, but Colab is much better and prob probably most of you have access to, uh, well, you do have access to Colab. So I thought that may be a better way for me to communicate. Okay, so this is the plan. Two minutes into it. Now we know the plan. Now, let's quickly look at uh, what do we mean by this, right? I mean, 3D volume data, like I already mentioned, if you work with MRI data, right? I mean, if you're MRI people, you know exactly what we are talking about. As long as you can read the files, uh, you know how to read the files, then you're all set, right? I mean, what library do you need to use to read, I don't know, a DICOM file, for example, right? So then you're all set. Everything else is playing with numbers, okay? Or whether it is your CT, like, computer tomography, whether it is biological uh, or industrial type of CT or micro CT, okay? The volume we are going to work with today is collected by uh, Zeiss X-Radia micro CT. Well, it's actually a X-ray microscope. Calling it micro CT would be a disgrace because it has optics and it is an X-ray microscope. So you can image uh, volumes at very high resolution, okay? So that's what I'm going to use, but uh, you can also work with FIPSIM dataset, right? I mean, focused ion beam scanning electron microscope by where you uh, uh, take a volume, image the surface, you know, cut the surface, image it, cut it, image it, and so on. Uh, how do you cut it? Using an ion beam, okay? This is a common process when it comes to electron microsco microscopy in 3D, okay? So any of these and even otherwise, as long as you have your 3D volume, your, uh, you know, uh, you should be able to uh, follow this uh, follow this process. Okay, now uh, let's uh, have a quick look at why do we need 3D unit to begin with? I mean, in the past we did uh, a one 2D slice at a time. If you have a volume, you can pick your plane, right? X, Y or Y, Z or whatever the plane is and then just work with one 2D plane at a time. So why 3D unit? Well, if your, uh, if your uh, volume is isotropic, uh, meaning if it looks the same no matter which direction you, you cut, then doing it one, uh, you know, one 2D slice at a time does make sense if your features are kind of isotropic and everything. But what if you deal with volumes that look like this? For example, here is an example of fiber reinforced material, right? Some sort of a composite material where you have like fibers going in one direction uh, and uh, if you actually look at these fibers at high resolution, again, X-ray microscope here, where fibers are segmented compared to fibers of different uh, diameter over there compared to these filler particles, right? So let's say this is what you're trying to, you're trying to segment. Well, what if you only look at the cross section and do one slice at a time? Yeah, you have these large, bigger, uh, uh, you know, fibers obviously lower density, so you can see those bigger fibers here, and then you have the small fibers here, but then uh, as you go along, some of these may disappear. What if they are not exactly perpendicular? What if they are slightly slanted? Then this don't look circular, they look a bit oval. Some of those, uh, if you are looking at particles, right, uh, if you don't provide some context, like elongated particles, for example, if you don't provide some context in the sense of how it looks, uh, let's say, uh, 
10 slices below and 10 slices above, you don't get the full story about it. So my point here that I'm trying to make is there is always a case where 3D provides you the additional context that an image needs in order to segment it in a proper way. That's why 3D unit can be very helpful for most 3D data sets where you will have some sort of an isotropy involved uh, with it, okay? I'll leave it to you to compare 2D slice by slice plus, uh, uh, you know, or 3D and then compare the intersection over union values to see does it actually make sense. But I'll give you all the information needed right now to be able to get there, okay? Now, uh, 2D unit, again, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the architecture itself. We know that, right? There is an encoder path, there is a decoder path. In the encoder, you're going from a large image to a smaller vector, and then that vector gets uh, uh, upscaled back into the original, uh, original image size, and then what you get out is a segmentation image. So this is a 2D, and these are all 2D convolution. You see here convolution is three by three, and max pulling is two by two. 3D unit is very similar, except as you can imagine, the convolution is going to be, uh, I don't think it's given here, but the convolution is going to be three by three by three. And up uh, and, and this, uh, let's go back one step. And max pulling is going to be two by two by two. Okay, so anytime you have this three by three, like, you know, two, two dimensional uh, matrix, think of three dimensional tensor when we are talking about uh, uh, 3D. That's, that's the only uh, difference. Uh, the architecture is very similar. Now, just like UNET, where we have seen, uh, uh, where we saw this in the last few tutorials, you can replace the encoder part with uh, one of the uh, backbones like ResNet or VGG16 or any of those, and then uh, mimic the uh, you know upscaling part of so or design the upscaling part to mimic you know, the, the encoder part, okay? So meaning you can still have the unit architecture, but replace your encoder with something else, okay? Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. In fact, we are going to use exactly that approach. Uh, where do you get your uh, unit? I mean, if you can write your own code to design your own 3D unit, fine, great, go ahead and do that. If you cannot do that, if you want to use a pre-configured unit, just type 3D unit in uh, GitHub like I did. And there are many re uh, repos. And if you go into any of these repos, uh, you can actually get hold of their original code. Obviously, uh, be sensitive to the licensing. Uh, please read the licensing. Uh, in this case, this is GPL 3.0. This is MIT license. So understand what that means. And some do not have any license, but I still try not to copy code because this person probably uh, got the code from somewhere else and forgot to put the licensing or attach the licensing or something. So I'm a bit, uh, uh, I try to be a bit careful when it comes to code like this. And whatever code I'm giving you, I'm sensitive to this, but uh, my code from GitHub, just look underneath, you know, the description uh, for my GitHub repo, you can, you can download it and I'm sharing mine for educational purposes. So do whatever you want with that code, okay? So you can do any of this. You can take this code and uh, customize it for yourself. Or what I prefer to do is take advantage of existing libraries. Uh, Python libraries. This is much more uh, stable and reliable in my view. And that's why I'm going to use uh, Segmentation Models 3D. In fact, if you go to uh, one of these repos, you will actually find the Segmentation Models, okay? Uh, you just pip install Segmentation Models 3D. We are going to do this in Colab. Don't worry, every step we are going to do this. This is going to be slightly long video, but it's definitely worth it. I hope you'll watch this in its entirety, especially if you're interested in 3D unit, okay? So I'm going to use this, and uh, it, uh, the advantage of this is now we can actually use any of these architectures. Uh, I'm going to focus on unit, but if you want to use LinkNet, you can go ahead and uh, use it, right? So this gives us nice, uh, uh, easy way of experimenting with diff uh, different architectures. And for a given architecture, you can experiment with various backbones. You can put ResNet 50 as the backbone. VGG 16 is my favorite, so I'm going to use that. Or EfficientNet is the uh, new way. I haven't tested that, but you can test that. So any of these, uh, this is this is a great library. Okay. So this is the plan, and uh, I think that's the last of it. And let me jump into our Google Colab so we can actually uh, pick it up from there. Okay. Okay, and uh, again, before jumping into the code, one other quick note. I am going to use, for any 3D visualization purposes or annotation purposes, I'm going to use appear, A-P-E-E-R.com. It's free, go ahead and sign up. 
this uh, has tools for for example if i go in this has tools for me to annotate for example i can upload my files in this case i uploaded a whole bunch of files here and you can open each uh, you know any of your file and annotate meaning like label your images so i've done that for a few of the slices in my image okay or a small sub volume in my image and uh, how does my image look like it looks like this okay and it has, uh, as I can slide through, you can see it has about 448, uh, uh, 448 uh, slices there. And uh, uh, this is the last one. And you can step through each of these and you can see how the volume is changing. OK, and all of this is free. You can actually visualize these on your phone if you want, even though on a big screen it makes sense. And if I switch this to 3D, you can see uh, the 3D volume uh, right there. Again, I can change the settings to make it better. So. Once we segment, we'll revisit here to make sure, okay, our segmented images look great. I hit uh, visualization in Python. Of course, there are a few libraries that let you do that. I'm not a big fan of doing that. I'm a big fan of actually leveraging other software dedicated to do these type of tasks, okay? So this is the plan. This is, let's go back to 2D so you can see. This is my raw image and uh, uh, that we are trying to segment. OK, and uh, the volumes that I already annotated, the small volumes here, I'm showing those right there. So this is like about uh, how many slices, 256 uh, slices and the dimensions are 256 by 256 of my training images. So, OK, the little ones that you see here are my training images and the dimensions are 256 by 256 by 256. And this is corresponding training mask. And this is what I'm talking about. Like I manually annotated. This takes a lot of patience or get a data set that already has been annotated. But here you can just go to machine learning and add a class. I added class zero, class one, class two, class three. Uh, paint the pixels here because you have all the tools and uh, uh, and save them, right? So this is how I got my uh, I got my labels. Okay, so far so good. Now let's jump into my uh, Python notebook here. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, jump in. Now please pay attention here. Again, this is on Google Colab. Sign up for your free account. Uh, make sure you go ahead and link your uh, link your uh, Google Drive so you can actually store your data. So that's exactly what I've done in my Google Drive. I stored under Colab Notebooks under data. This is my sandstone 3d in sandstone 3d i have all the images that i would like to segment later on and my training data and my training data is basically two files one is training images the other one is training masks and you can see each one is 256 by 256 by 256 okay so uh, almost 13 minutes into it we haven't actually gotten to this but all of this is very useful information if you're not used to collab or if you're not used to any of this okay trying to make sure we are all on the same page so let's close the left hand side now that you have an uh, idea okay so let's run this line by line and i'm going to explain this and i hope this looks okay but just in case let's go ahead and zoom in a couple steps 200 percent that's big enough uh, make sure when you go to runtime make sure you actually uh, change the runtime type to gpu by default it's supposed to be uh, none which means it's only using cpu change this to gpu okay and then it'll say okay do you want to restart the runtime go ahead and do that now let's run line by line this is just comments i like to add uh, a lot of comments i'll share this code with you so don't worry and uh Latest TensorFlow, if you don't mention, uh, in Google Colab is 2.4. And when I tried to do this in 2.4, the library that we are going to use, Segmentation Models 3D, is throwing up some um, some some weird errors. So uh, ideally, it should work in TensorFlow 2.2, for example. But uh, in uh, uh, in Google Colab, to to do that, you have to pip install 2.2. The easiest way to do that is, OK, let's go ahead and use the latest version in one point something. I think it's 1.15 or something. OK, uh, go ahead and try this. If uh, new TensorFlow, when you're watching this video, TensorFlow 2.5 comes up, maybe that error goes away. But I this is working fine. So you can do this today. OK. Uh, OK, so let's go ahead and set our TensorFlow version to 1.x. And it's going to say, uh, OK, 1.x selected. We'll test exactly what version we have in a minute. And then let's install segmentation models uh, 3D. OK, and one of the prerequisites, I mean, two prerequisites for this is you need to have classification models and efficient dash 3D. OK, so we are going to pip install all these three. So let's go ahead and do that. It should be pretty quick. 
as, as you'll see right here. So it's done with classification models. These are very small packages, okay? And all of these are done. There you go. And now let's go ahead and install Patchify. Again, I love this library. Uh, to handle or to divide our images into smaller patches. So if remember our training images are 256 by 256 by 256, but I cannot load an entire 256 by 256 by 256 image into, into, uh, into RAM here. So I'm going to divide that into batches of 64 by 64 by 64. I hope that makes sense. So I have a 256 by 256 by 256, and I'm dividing that into small cubes of 64 by 64 by 64, okay? And then uh, how do you do that? Well, you can write your own code, but Patchify helps us do that, whether it is 2D or 3D. We already tested 2D before, right? So let's go ahead and install Patchify. You'll see what I'm talking about uh, when we get there. Okay, so this one, uh, it'll give some error, but it's, it's fine, it just installs it, okay? If you run it second time, for example, that that will not show up i hope uh, so yeah this is this is basically uh, done and the next step let's verify what version tensorflow uh, we have and what version uh, keras we have so tensorflow um, i think it's 1.15 if you select one yeah 1.15.2 and keras is 2.3.1 again uh, if you are using colab sometime in February 2021, then uh, you should probably have something similar. Okay, now uh, let's just make sure the GPU is available, right? I mean, uh, uh, it says, okay, GPU, but I'd like to say, is it really available? Is it really using it? So it says found GPU at uh, zero. We have only one GPU access under the free account. So yeah, sure, we have that ready. And now let's uh, import, now that all the installation is done, well, for now, we'll do more installations later. The next step is importing our required libraries, right? Segmentation Models 3D is the key library that we'd like to install. As you can see, it's working on Keras framework. Okay, so far so good. And all of these should be pretty straightforward to use. Scikit-Image, NumPy, Matplotlib uh, from Keras import the backend, uh, and uh, uh, we are going to import the train test split to split our data into training and testing data sets. The only thing that you may not be familiar with is Patchify that we just installed. So from Patchify, import both Patchify and Unpatchify. What that means is both uh, uh, divide that into the volume into individual patches and also put the patches back together because once we segment our small volumes, we have to put them back together, right? So that's exactly what's going on here. So let's go ahead and import all of those. Now let's uh, load our input images again. I showed you that my input images are down here. So all I need to do is just go there and say, copy the path of the file. And that's exactly what I've done here. Again, this is obviously unique to uh, Google Colab. If you're doing this on your local system, obviously put the, you know, uh, put the, uh, uh, location of your local file. So I'm doing that both for my image and the mask, right? I have my image volume and I have my mask volume. So these are the paths. And once I have these, I'm dividing them into patches. So my image is going to be divided into patches by using the patchify. Remember, we imported this patchify right there. So we're going to use patchify. And what is my input? Input is the image. Patchify into what shape? 64 by 64 by 64 at a step size of 64. That means it divides the volume into 64, 64, 64, moves it 64 pixels, and then 64 pixels, and so on. If you do anything less than 64, that means you're uh, providing an overlap between you know, your volumes, okay? Uh, if you do that, make sure that when you do these, all the operations uh, kind of uh, cover your entire data set. If you have 256, uh, then you're doing 64 with 32 steps. Make sure uh, they add up to uh, uh, 256. If not, then you'll have some pixels left over and it doesn't know how to handle those, okay? The little things that you will probably learn when it throws an error. Uh, okay, so that's pretty much what's going on here. So basically we are dividing these into the image and mask into smaller patches that will go into our model. If you follow these steps, it's it's very simple, straightforward, whether you're working with Brat's data set or any data set, okay? How is your image? How is your mask? How do you load it? How do you break them down into smaller pieces? So we just loaded that. Now let's uh, make sure it's actually, you know, it, it we actually got the data, right? So I'm looking at, in fact, let's go ahead and uh, print the shape of IMG underscore 
patches dot shape right so is that what we have image patches because our image is 256 by 256 by 256 i just want to see what the shape is for our patches our pa uh, our image patches is 4 by 4 by 4 by 64 by 64 by 64 this we know because we are dividing our image into that volume sub volume 4 by 4 by 4 because what is 256 uh, which is 64 times 4 right is 256 so you have 4 in x 4 in y 4 in z or z so that's what these three are 4 by 4 by 4 by 64 by 64 by 64 so let's just pick an image at the first position uh second here third here that's what i'm doing here and the 20 30 second slice in z okay uh, just random it's up to you what you want to see i just want to make sure we are seeing something okay so uh and then you can also uh, uh i should i should have put this in a okay so that that looks okay right i mean i just wanted to make sure okay my mask and image are loading correctly and they're corresponding so this is my mask right now and i'm plotting image right now and the image and mask look like they're matching okay i do this a couple of times just to make sure uh, uh let's just go to i don't know let's just go to 20th this is a good exercise to do you know this is a good sanity check although this is a bad way to plot because a good way to plot is just define multiple plots so this is how our image is this is how our yeah i think we're good okay everything looks fine so now let's go to the next step next step is we have our input image right i mean our image patches and mask patches are of a size 4 by 4 by 4 by 64 by 64 by 64 we need to reshape this and let's go ahead and reshape these into the right shape and i'm co i'm collapsing all these 4 by 4 so if i if i run this you'll see the output shape is now 64 by 64 by 64 by 64 so all i'm doing is combining all of these into one vector instead of 4 4 4 okay so, uh, so and then these remains the same so if you go down here that's exactly what you see this 64 there are too many 64s but you know i should have used a different size image but this first one is basically the number of patches that we have total number of patches or sub volumes are 64 and then these three are x y and z of our volume so far so good i hope we are getting the data ready to be fed into our uh, uh, unit. Okay, next let's define number of classes. In this example, I have four classes, okay? Zero, one, two, three. So we have four classes and these four classes uh, correspond to zero is my dark area. One is uh, this this area, you see this this area that looks like this, but it has some texture to it. So this is different, okay? So this is one. Two, I believe is this. Uh, bulk of the image is uh, two and these bright areas are three okay so i have four different distinct regions in this image that i'm trying to segment so let's get back so these are number of classes four okay now uh, since i'm using a pre-configured network from segmentation models uh, when I initially ran that, it, it threw an error saying that, hey, expected these many uh, channels and you are only providing this. So that's why I added this step, which is, uh, remember our images are only 64 by 64 by 64, meaning they're all grayscale images. We need to convert them into RGB, like three channel images. The easiest way to do that is to just go ahead and stack the same image three times, okay? and uh, uh, we'll see that and then uh, when you do that you'll get 64 by 64 by 64 by 3 okay and uh, uh, and and for mask you don't you don't want to stack them for mask you just extend the uh, expand the dimensions by one again go ahead and print out the output shapes and everything after each step this is the best way to learn but i'm just re doing uh you know changing the 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 uh, dimensions that's all i'm trying to do both for the image and the mask for the image it expects three channels for mask it expects one channel right that's exactly why we are only expanding dimensions for the masks and stacking this for the images okay once you do that again this is multi-class classification this is not just binary so i'm going to convert my mask into categorical we talked about this in the last couple of tutorials when i talked about units uh, uh you know uh, multi-class unit so 
Until now, the mask only has values of 0, 1, 2, 3. But now, because this is multi-class classification using uh, UNET, we need to convert those into categorical so the system understands uh, how to interpret these. Okay, so when we, uh, again, I don't want to give a long lecture on what categorical is, uh, watch my video, or if you watch the last three, four, or five videos, I wasted enough time, or I spent enough time, I should say, talking about this categorical, okay? So basically, uh, it converts this into these four classes that we uh, you know uh, uh, that we define after that I'm just using a test train split uh, train test split to split my data into 90% for training 10% for testing I have a small volume but if you have a large I recommend always doing 70% for training 30% for testing maybe 80 20 but this is a bit small test size but it is what it is yeah so let's go ahead and run this after this, I should basically have X train, Y train ready for my training, right? Uh, now let's go ahead and define the uh, loss functions again. We have done this in our multi-class uh, unit semantic segmentation video. Please go ahead and watch that video. It's exactly the same dice coefficient and dice coefficient loss we are going to use right now as part of uh, as part of our uh, loss functions. Okay. Uh, I think that's exactly what we are using. If I go down and let's, uh, I just want to confirm that. So my loss function is total loss and metrics is metrics. In fact, maybe that's uh, maybe that's uh, that's something, forget what I just said. This is something that's left over from a while ago that I was experimenting with. This I'm not using this as you'll see because I'm using uh, the dice loss and focal loss. Okay, sorry about that. I should have commented this part. So let's come down. Now we are defining the actual parameters for our model. Remember, we can actually use uh, ResNet 34, ResNet 50, and a whole bunch of these. I picked VGG16 because I, I have gotten good results with VGG16. It's not as complicated, it's simple enough, and uh, to me, it turned out to be very reliable, so I usually use VGG16. It's up to you what you want to use. Okay, and uh, we are going to use ImageNet weights, so we are going to load these pre-trained weights, so our training starts from some good baseline and not from scratch okay so that's what we're going to use and the backbone is vgg16 and we're going to use uh, softmax activation why because this is multi-class classification and my patch size is going to be 64 we already defined that number of classes we defined it but i guess i'm defining again number of channels equals to three because we copied our x three times to make the dimension three and that's what it expects here uh, learning rate, uh, we are uh, going to use an optimizer, Adam optimizer, with a custom learning rate like of uh, three zeros one. Okay, this is a good starting point uh, for learning rate. When it comes to loss functions, again, I talked about this in the last few uh, uh, videos about UNET. Uh, dice loss is good because it's similar to intersection over union. Focal loss is good because it it deals very well with. Uh, balance unbalanced data sets a combination of these i guess is better so that's what we are doing here with an equal weight for focal and dice loss okay and finally what metrics do we want to track while uh, while we are training we want to track both iou score intersection over union score and also the f score okay so this is what this block of code is doing let's go ahead and run it and then the next step is we are almost getting there the next step is pre-processing Almost all of what I'm doing right now is exactly what we have done for multi-class unit semantic segmentation. Unnecessarily, some people make these more complicated than they should be. I hope by relating this, by using the code that we have already used for 2D, you uh, can relate with this a bit better. Okay, that's the whole point here. That's exactly why I'm using the same example here. Okay. Pre-processing the input. These models, uh, you know, they have been trained on uh, on uh, data that has been pre-processed in a certain way. And we want to use the same pre-processing. That's exactly I'm why I'm defining uh, my pre-process input object, uh, uh, which uh, looks at, okay, what backbone are we using? We are using VGG16 backbone, right? Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, it knows now, okay, how to pre-process. Now I'm applying that pre-process input onto my training data and testing data. So after this, my training and testing would be pre-processed. Well, the pre-processing can be normalizing your data, uh, scaling your data, 
uh, right? I mean, so however they pre-processed, I want them to pre-process it exactly the same way. If you're building your own custom unit, then you may ignore this step, or in fact, I recommend dividing your pixel values by 255 so you your values go between zero to one, okay? You know that anyhow. Okay, so we have pre-processed it, and now let's go ahead and define the model, right? This is the, this is the easy part defining the model and how do you define that from segmentation models let's get unit remember you can get unit you can do link net and a couple others also let's focus on unit from segmentation models get unit and the backbone is uh, classes equals to uh, how many ever number of classes we have uh, input shape is this uh, again your input shape is patch size by patch size by patch size right 64 by 64 by 64 times 3 I mean three channels that's my input shape encoder weights again uh, equals to encoder weights do we have our encoder uh, weights anywhere uh, right there we are using ImageNet right there okay so that's our encoder weights and activation is our activation right I mean we already defined our activation once you define the model we need to compile it using our optimizer that we just defined uh, our optimizer optimizer was uh, uh, the Adam optimizer with a learning rate of 0 0.301 and uh, finally our loss is the total loss dice loss plus focal loss and metrics IOU and so on so let's go ahead and import this when you do this the first time as you can see it's downloading uh, the VGG uh, weights and uh, it should since we have a uh, print command here it should actually print out the entire network for us okay so here it is so let's go down and you can see how the network looks like 64 64 by 3 and then it goes progressively down all the way to a shape of 2 by 2 by 2 by 512 and then upscaling from this point all the way back to our original image size hopefully which is 64 by 64 by 64 and how many classes do we have four right we have four outputs so you'll get four outputs we are using softmax function uh, for activation of the last layer so you're going to get four probabilities all of them should add up to one because this is softmax and we are going to apply an argmax later meaning uh, of those four probabilities which one has the highest probability that is the class I want to define for that right so that's how we convert probability into a class so far I hope you're with me okay now let's go ahead and fit the model again this is uh, relatively fast meaning it only takes like 10 minutes or so or 50, uh, I forgot like 42 seconds per epoch so uh, f you know 4200 seconds for the whole thing I have already done that so I don't waste your time so as you can see uh, one thing let's actually look at uh, let me scroll this all the way to the right you see the validation IOU score a good sign is it starts at 9%, it slowly goes up, goes up, goes up, and then it seems to be saturating at about 70%, right? So I'm not getting any uh, better IOU than 70%. This data set is specifically, especially very difficult data set uh, to segment. Uh, one of the phases is very difficult. You saw that, that, that clustered one, the textured one. Uh, so 70% is not bad, uh, especially with, uh, with this 3D unit. Uh, if I have more training data, I probably could have achieved, uh, uh, or with augmentation, I should have tried that. Maybe I could achieve uh, higher scores, but this is this is fine. How does it actually look like? If I go down, there you go. It doesn't look bad, right? I mean, both my validation, as you can see, training loss and validation loss look uh, very nice. Nothing unusual there. Same with my IOU. Okay, nothing unusual there. IOU tends to jump uh, uh, like this compared to accuracy, okay? Okay, now that we have that, I uh, I basically uh, saved this after, after training. If you actually follow this, I saved the model, just so I can show you right now by importing it, okay? Let's continue by importing the model. So I saved this model, so I'm going to use uh, uh, load model to load this model and make sure you type compile equals to false uh, because we are going to use this only for uh, predictions and not to continue the training, okay? Uh, okay, so it got loaded and now let's go ahead and predict on some test data. Remember, we have 10% for testing. So you can predict, uh, all you need to do is my model.predict on xtest 
And then remember the argmax I just mentioned, if you only predict, all you're going to get is four probabilities, right? So when you do argmax along, the, along that axis, which is the fourth axis where you have the probabilities, then you actually get the maximum value uh, giving you that probability. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, what did we do? This is uh, y prid argmax. Yeah, and then I'm also uh, looking at the argmax for testing so we can actually compare those, okay? So let's go ahead and run those. And finally, let's look at the shape of each of these. Yeah, once that's done, it's actually, uh, it should take uh, a little while because we have some 3D volume data that it's predicting on. And now that it's done, I just want to make sure you uh, you look at this. So when you look at why predict argmax uh, shape, it's seven images, each 64 by 64 by 64, right? And uh, uh, seven images, uh, y test 64 by 64 by 64. Now, ideally, I mean, NP unique y predict argmax. Apparently, I'm on uh, the values that I'm getting out after the prediction are two and three in uh, in this volume. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, yeah, let's leave that for now. Okay, I I was expecting zero, one, two, three all to show up. This is VGG 16. Let's do one more time. I'm sorry. Let's load the model. Let's go ahead and predict this one more time and uh, let's run this one more time. Okay, that's fine. It is what it is. Um, you can test your uh, IOU, you know, with uh, given that you have these two, this, this data. But uh, again, uh, if you want to use the Keras built-in metrics like mean IOU, it only works on TensorFlow higher than 2.0. And remember, we are using TensorFlow 1.15, so I cannot show you this right now. Uh, so let's test this on some random images. So all I'm doing is uh, from uh, from our test data set, I'm just selecting a, an image at a random, predicting it, and then we are going to look at the ground truth image, okay? And then plot the ground truth versus the prediction. So that looks, that looks very nice. This is the ground truth and this is the prediction. And I just picked one slice to display. We are predicting the entire test volume, which would be 64 by 64 by 64. So if I go back, uh, where where are we? Where are we? So if I change the slice number, I just put slice 14, right? So let's go back to slice number 25 or something. I don't know what that is. But as long as the testing and prediction looks the same, we are good. Okay, just go ahead and do this on a few random images. You're all set. Now. Uh, let's go ahead and segment the full volume using the trained model. So how do you segment the full volume? Go ahead and load it, right? You load this full 44, 48 images that I have, and then patch, you, uh, go ahead and patchify it 64 by 64, by exactly the same steps we did for our training. And uh, uh, in fact, let's let's do this. Let's. Uh, I've already done this. I'll show you the result, but I just want to show you intermediate results here. So the volume is itself 448 images each image is 512 by 512, right? Each 2D image is 512 by 512, and I have 448 of those. Why 448? Because, I mean, I actually cropped my volume to fit it to 448 because 448 is divisible by 64. If not, it doesn't know how to handle that, the remaining volume, okay? So this means now I have, uh, after patchifying it, I have seven by eight by eight, 64 by 64 by 64 volumes. Yeah, this obviously makes sense, right? I mean, you have 448, seven times 64 is 448, eight times 64 is 512, eight times 64, 512, and then each image is 64 by 64 by 64, right? Math makes sense. Now, I just wrote a uh, quick nested for loop for IJK in what? In seven, eight, and eight, right? So go through each image each 3D volume, go ahead and uh, extract that volume, the small 64 by 64 by 64. And remember, we can we multiplied that by three times to make that RGB, like three channel, because our input expects three channel. And then go ahead and pre-process. Do not forget to pre-process, right? You always have to pre-process the input. Uh, 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 and, and, and then now I applied dot predict and then argmax, these are all the steps we just followed. Now I'm doing that for the entire volume and putting that volume back into capturing all the uh, segmented images into an empty list, converting the list into a NumPy array, and finally reshape, 
uh, let's do this. Sorry, uh, this step takes a while, but I want you to see, I'll go ahead and pause this video at this point because it takes, uh, I think like 30 seconds to one minute. So let me go ahead and pause this uh, because I really want to make sure, uh, I really want to make sure uh, you see how the dimensions, you know, how you can keep track of the shape. Yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, pause this for a second. Okay, so uh, finally it's done. It, it just took like additional 30 seconds after <laughs> I stopped talking. Uh, so the uh, prediction is done. So what we have right now is, remember, a list, right, uh, of all these patches. We need to convert that into a NumPy array. That's exactly what we are doing here. And you can see the shape. Now our shape is 448 images, each 64 by 64 by 64, right? So this is this is what we, we uh, started off with. Now we need to put these back into one large image uh, that we started off with, right? Uh, so let's put them back into the original volume. The way I'm doing that is, first of all, reshape this into the, the, uh, the shape where, where was it? This shape, seven by eight by eight by 64, 64, 64, because that's when unpatchify can be applied, yeah? So let's go down and reshape this. And now the shape is reshaped to this shape. And now you can do unpatchify, right? Which is exactly the opposite of what we did from patchify. So let's go ahead and unpatchify it and then look at the shape 448 by 512 by 512, okay? It's just playing with these numbers and Patchify makes it easy for us to do this. That's exactly why we pip install that. Now, if you look at the data type of this reconstructed image, it's integer 64, meaning each value is defined as int 64 in my segmented image, even though they have a values of 0, 1, 2, 3, right? That's tremendous waste of our uh, memory to do this. In fact, if you save this as a volume, as an image, your image would be, uh, I believe, uh, I mean, uh, compared to eight bit, eight times larger. And you cannot open this in any program. So that's why I want to convert all of these output into eight bit, uh, unsigned, uh, unsigned integer eight. Okay, so this is how you convert and then go ahead and print the reconstructed image type is unsigned integer eight. And now that we have a volume of size 448 by 512 by 512, let's go ahead and save it. If you just use like uh, OpenCV or something to save, you will only get one slice saved because they don't understand TIFF stacks. So for uh, the to write this properly into a nice TIFF stack, use the TIFF file library or any other library that supports this type of data. And I'm just go, uh, saving it. And let's go ahead and show you how the saved volume looks like. There you go. This is the exported volume. And these are all segmented images. And this is our input image, if you remember. Uh, let's go back to our image number one. This is our image number one here of the segmented image. Okay. And these are zero, one, two, and three values. So now you have, I mean, in fact, uh, uh, again, I'm using a peer.com, but in fact, you can actually go ahead and, uh, uh, sorry, let me go ahead and show you this, that this is a, indeed a 3D volume. Now, if you are interested only in the bright areas, then you can just go here and say, okay, I just want zero, one, two, show me only the, uh, uh, the pixels between range two and three, right? So now you're only looking at this. This is not the right way to do it though. What if I just want to see only the, uh, or work with, not just see or own, work with only the, the uh, region with pixel value of one or pixel value of two. So the best way to deal with that is, let's just convert our image or output into a multi-channel output. So you can work with individual channels. Not every software can work with that. You can do uh, use a peer, you can use Zen, for example, Z-E-N or Z-E-N. Uh, from Zeiss, you can actually download a free version called Zen Lite, Z E N L I T E, Zen Lite. Go ahead and Google search. You can download that, and you can open 3D images, and uh, you can open multi-channel images. But what we are trying to do here is, uh, let's go ahead and look at uh, the unique pixels in our reconstructed image. So we have zero, one, two, three. We know that, right? I mean, in our image, that's exactly what we see here. Uh, zero, one, two, three. If I go to 2D image. Oh, sorry, I'm just showing you up. Oh, where do I, oh, there you go. So we have like zero, one, two, three, right? So these are uh, the pixel values. So what I'm trying to do is uh, literally do the basic of basic segmentation, which is, okay, 
My segment SEGM0 is basically my reconstructed image where all the pixel values, uh, where, where the pixel values are equal to zero. Segment one is where the pixel values are equal to one. So I'm taking my reconstructed image and splitting into four different images. Uh, each or four different volumes. Each volume is basically a, uh, a binary volume where it is either zero or one. Zero if it doesn't belong to that class, one if it belongs to that class, meaning if it has these values, right? So that's what I'm doing here. And then I'm putting them back into a array called final, okay? where I created an empty array of the same shape as original, but then putting them as different channels. You see, channel zero, one, two, three. So in addition to X, Y, Z, I'm actually adding another channel, another uh, channel here, and uh, I'm compiling them into this, this uh, uh, right there. Okay, so at the end of this, I should actually have uh, my final, that is a uh, multi-channel uh, 3D volume. Now I need to figure out a way to save it. Okay, the best way to do that is, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with OME TIFF uh, file format. OME TIFF stands for Open Microscopy Environment TIFF. So it's basically a TIFF volume, except it supports multi-dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, the AP same. I'm sticking with Appear. I have to uh, push a bit for the team I work uh, with every day at work. Uh, so Appear, go ahead. Our guys actually released this Appear OME TIFF library that you can use to put together these. Uh, the, if you have your own f favorite way, go fine, right? So uh, go ahead and pip install. And then once you do that, go ahead and import IO, just like you import IO from scikit image or something. And then you can go ahead and uh, uh, write this. So the way I'm writing it is again, uh, OEMITIF uh, file format. The first uh, dimension represents the uh, uh, time unit because your, your volume or your data set can be a function of time. At time zero, this is how it looks like. Time one, it looks like this, right? So the first one represents the timestamp. The second one is the Z, the depth. The third one is the channels, right? In our case, we have four channels and the next two are X and Y. That's what this is. So I'm just, these two lines are basically getting it to that shape and then writing it, okay? And once, uh, I mean, uh, converting that into in, uh, int eight format so we can write it and basically, here, I'm just using io.writeOME tiff, write it to this. And what happens when you do that? Uh, well, let's go to our final image right there. This is what happens. If I now switch to channels, you see instead of one volume previously, we had one volume, either bl uh, black and I mean grayscale or nothing. And this volume contains uh, information about each pixel either having a value of zero, one, two, three. Here, when we write it as a multi-channel, each image is a binary image. So if I turn off these three channels and only look at the blue one, the blue channel is a binary. Either background is zero or I have one, okay? So this is what a multi-channel image is. And as you can see, it helps us study each of these. If I only am interested in the blue, whatever these, these dark regions are, now I can actually go through step by step and uh, look at how you know, the, this this evolves as I go through the volume. Or uh, let's go back and uh, look at uh, the yellow one because this is, uh, okay? And now let's convert this to, I mean, view this in 3D. So there you go, there's the 3D view. And now you can do all kinds, I mean, even if you wanna do math on this, you can go ahead and uh, apply math only on, for example, you wanna do particle size distribution of only the features in yellow channel. It's very easy, right? You just go here and say, okay, now you already have that, right? I mean, segment three is basically what you're looking at in yellow. So do all the math only using segment three. Do your uh, you know, uh, object uh, uh, parameter reporting and all that stuff only on that specific channel, okay? so. In summary, 3D unit is not scary, even though it took almost uh, uh, 50 minutes or so, you know, to, for me to cover this, but most of it is data handling, getting your data ready. But uh, uh, thanks to these people at segmentation models or uh, numerous re repos on GitHub, we don't have to put together our own 3D unit. You can for practice. If you're 
uh, if, you, if you are a computer science major, if you are a machine learning major, you have to go through that process. But if you are like me or an engineer or a scientist, you know, who uses these as tools to solve other problems, uh, then, then, then you, it's a waste of your time to reinvent what others have done. So try to leverage existing libraries. It, there is no shame in that because in fact, you, you, you're more productive that way. Go ahead and leverage other existing libraries and uh, uh, make your work more efficient, okay? Again, the, the place I used uh, for, uh, for annotations and visualization is a peer. We are in the process of redesigning this to make it more uh, you know, uh, machine learning focused. We already have 2D units uh, built in if you don't want to write your own code we have like 2d unit uh, with that uses efficient net for example you know for your image segmentation so the ecosystem everything is in here it's free so test out a peer and uh, do not forget to subscribe to my channel here and like this video because i'm pretty sure after 50 minutes of this video I'm sure you're exhausted, but you absolutely feel very good about yourself for learning something new about UNIT. So thank you very much, and let's meet again in the next video.